Hello, I'm Richard of Quatrefoils Limited. We're chartered building surveyors and construction consultants. We've put together a number of useful videos for you covering a variety of topics which we hope that you'll enjoy. Whether you're a trainee building surveyor, qualified surveyor, architect or just member of the public, we hope there's something for everybody here um, to learn from. Uh, if you look through to the end of the presentation, there'll be some useful links to look through for additional further reading. If you enjoy it, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. See you in the future. Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be looking at period building characteristics. We'll be looking at buildings throughout the ages and we'll be giving you an overview of some of their key features to correctly identify them, as well as highlighting some of their common defects. My name is Richard and we are Quatrefoils Limited. Just an initial point worth mentioning. The video presentations we cover in this series are intended to provide an overview of each topic, focusing on the fundamentals, and will generally provide an introduction to each subject. We would advise further research and reading should you need to learn any of these topics in more detail. Now, let's get started. So let's start with a definition. What is building pathology? So, Building pathology has been defined as the study or science of a disease or symptoms of a disease, which in our case relates to symptoms of building failure. It in short is a method for assessing buildings, identifying and diagnosing building defects. Typically, a defect in a building can be traced back to three key areas, poor workmanship, poor design, or manufacturer defect of material, or any combination of these. Correct diagnosis of the building defect is of paramount importance, so one must adopt a holistic approach when assessing a situation. In order to correctly diagnose a defect, one needs to have a good understanding of the building they are assessing, its age, components and structure, and what were some of the common issues associated with this type of building. This is essential and a good starting point before carrying out any detailed analysis or diagnosis. So let's take a quick look at the different types of period buildings. Over the centuries, buildings have developed and quite often have a direct correlation with the era and what the trends and beliefs were at that time. First of all, we have the Tudor era, spanning from around 1485 to 1603. These were often pretty black and white buildings, half timbered. This includes the Elizabethan era, from 1550 to 1603. Next, we have the Stuart or Jacobean era. This went between 1604 and 1713, and these were commonly flat-fronted buildings with exposed brick and stone. Following on from the Stuart and Jacobean era, there was the Georgian era from 1714 to 1820. These buildings were very distinctive, with lots of symmetry, proportion and balance. After this was the Victorian era, dating from 1837 to 1901. Buildings of this time often had bay windows, coloured brickwork and decorative features. They're quite distinctive. The Edwardian era, at the beginning of the 20th century, was relatively short, spanning from 1901 to 1914, and continued many similar features to that in the Victorian period before. Edwardian buildings, however, were often on slightly wider plots than those of the Victorian times, and commonly included front porches and balconies. So we're now well into the 20th century. In the 1920s and 1930s, Buildings were often of a mock Tudor style, with a mixture of exposed brickwork, render or pebble-dashed finishes. A typical example of such types of buildings would be the Metroland developments that surrounded London. Then there were the 1945 and 1970s type buildings. These dwellings often were semi-detached and similar to those in the 20s and 30s. 
The commercial buildings in this era often had a more brutalist design, with lots of concrete. After this, there were a range of buildings and designs and styles bringing us into the 21st century, which for the purposes of this presentation we're not going to cover in any great detail, but we'll provide some links for further reading at the end. Now, let's take a closer look at each era. So here we are in the Tudor era. These buildings often had thatched roofs, sometimes clay tiles, with rendered wall finishes on wattle and daub, and exposed brickwork depending upon the age. One key feature for identifying Tudor properties is the jetty. You'll see from the photographs on the right, this overhang of the first floor above the ground floor is known as the jetty. Here's an interesting thing for you to look up. Try and find online what a dragon beam is on a Tudor building. Carrying on, exposed timber beams were also a key feature of Tudor buildings alongside tall, narrow windows and doors. Windows and glass were the latest innovation and were very expensive. These were often made of small, irregular panes held together with lead strips. The extent of glass and windows on your property was a sign of wealth, and it was actually common for owners to take their window glass with them when they moved. Can you imagine that nowadays? Chimney stacks are commonly an issue with Tudor buildings, as these were often later additions which were not always weathered and pointed correctly, primarily at the stack to roof junction, whether originally or through poor maintenance. Originally, the chimney may have just been a hole in a thatched roof or in the gable ends of the property. At the time, the chimney was quite a modern innovation. Because of the style of the buildings, the height and design of the roofs can be awkward for maintenance, and often scaffolding or a tower or cherry picker are needed to access the higher levels of the roof safely for maintenance, which can be expensive. Other common issues include the deterioration and rotting of timber, which can be costly, as these are normally major structural components. So now on to the Stuart and Jacobean era. The first part of this era is considered to be the second part of the Renaissance period of British architecture. Well-known architect Inigo Jones was a heavy influence at this time, which brought Italian style to many of the building designs, which alongside French and Flemish styles and components resulted in some unique and stunning buildings. Symmetry was a key focus in Jacobean architecture, with Gothic influences and many decorative elements. Often flat-faced in design, round arch arcades, gable roofs, these buildings were often spacious and elaborate and were considered an exaggeration on the buildings from the previous Elizabethan era. The Great Fire of London presented and highlighted a number of faults with buildings and had a great influence on how British homes and buildings evolved. This then sparked a focus on building new homes and buildings primarily with brick. Georgian buildings are quite distinctive. These buildings are notorious for their symmetrical design, balance and harmony. With sash windows as a key feature, these would often get smaller as the floors go up with the largest windows on the ground or lower ground floors. Often with stucco finish and cornices, the roofs and gutters were usually concealed behind a principal elevation, commonly with perimeter parapet walls at roof level. A typical feature was generous room sizes, high ceilings and large entertaining spaces, reflective of the lifestyle of that era. Some typical defects include issues with the chimney stacks and parapet walls not being weathered or maintained properly, as well as internal gutters causing damp and leaks. Nails used for fixing roof coverings were often not galvanised and would rust which also caused issues. In addition, Decay and rotting of timber windows was also a problem, as well as rotting of the timber lintels above the windows and doors. These were commonly built into the masonry walls, which would get wet and damp over time, causing rot to occur. Damp itself was also an issue. The solid walls at this time often didn't have a damp-proof course, which gave rise to rising damp. No pun intended. We're now moving forward to the Victorian era. 
These were well known for their bay windows. Decorative features such as dentil detailing at eaves level and the stone inserts around windows are more often asymmetrical in design. This period saw a significant change in domestic housing alongside the Industrial Revolution. Mass manufacturing meant that many more people were able to purchase properties. Roof coverings were commonly slate with pitched roof designs and single glazed sash windows. Common defects at this time included rotting of timber members, such as lintels over windows and Bressima beams above the bays. There's also bonding timbers set into the internal skin of the walls on many houses into which the sash window frames are nailed. Damp issues also continued with the lack of adequate damp proof courses, and again these would either be non-existent or in some cases may have included a single or double layer of slate. Lead pipework in Victorian buildings was, and still does, present a significant health risk to occupants. In addition, many people have replaced the lighter weight slates with clay or concrete tiles over the years, and the additional load on the roof structure can cause deflection of the timber rafters and even roof spread. The list of common defects is quite exhaustive, we're merely scraping the surface. Please do continue to do your own research and investigate these further. Similar to Victorian properties, these dwellings continued to showcase similar features, including bay windows with inset sashes and typically gabled front roofs as per the building on the right hand side. There are some distinctive features such as the use of balconies, porches and verandas, although these types of buildings are quite easy to confuse with their Victorian predecessors. Some bathrooms and toilets were now also located inside, whereas they may previously have been located externally. The building plots are often wider in the Edwardian than Victorian era, and after the heaviness and clutter of Victorian homes, people wanted larger, more airy dwellings, which explains why many were built in suburban areas outside the busier cities and towns. The common defects in this age of dwelling are similar to those of Victorian homes. The 1920s and 1930s were the era of Metroland, where the Metropolitan Railway extended out the network of rail lines outside of London into the suburbs, bought the land up and then sold it on to developers for a profit. The buildings of this period often retained the bay window feature with small hipped roofs and front gables. They would have a lot of exposed brickwork along with render and pebble dashed finishes, often at different floor levels. In Metroland, there were regularly the, the mock Tudor designed buildings with exposed timber beams and the small projecting front jetty, continuing the black and white design. Windows may include diamond shaped lead pattern. In 1930s buildings, with the typical solid external wall measuring some nine inches thick, rising damp can often be a problem. This is less commonly due to a failure of the damp proof course, as many people believe, than it is raising of the external ground levels by the installation of paths or driveways which then bridge the damp proof course and floor ventilation. If the walls are of cavity design, then they will be early and you should keep an eye out for horizontal cracking at approximately 450 mm centres, which is an indication of corrosion of the wall ties, which in this era would have not been galvanised. Also keep an eye out for structural movement. The foundations for this type of building are often far more shallower than they are for modern structures, but also the windows can be load bearing in nature and when the single glazed windows were removed to install double glazing you can end up with dropping of the roofs and bowing of the front bay so keep an eye out for this. In this era properties were commonly semi-detached or detached and would often have side garages and driveways. There were also many high-rise tower blocks with concrete being a common material for construction. This was partly due to the hundreds and thousands of homes that had been destroyed in bombing during the Second World War. Properties had to be constructed cheaply and quickly, 
and in some respects less care and attention to detail was given with the design and construction of these. With asphalt flat roofs and hipped tiled roofs, these properties were more simplistic than some of the previous eras. Open plan areas were preferred with rectangular house designs. There were a number of issues with buildings of this era. There were many problems surrounding the concrete used in high-rise blocks. For example, poorly compacted concrete. The use of ungalvanized reinforcement, which would rust and expand, causing the concrete to crack and fail. Cold bridges were also common, for example, where concrete lintels were used, and damp would penetrate these areas and show up internally. The use of concrete meant buildings were often quite cold and not always well heated. This resulted in condensation forming. Again, there are a significant number of building defects which affect the various buildings throughout the ages, and we hope you have enjoyed this introductory presentation on the subject. Thank you for watching. We've given a few references and links for further reading below which we would recommend. If you have any questions or simply want to get in touch, please contact us through quatrefoils.co.uk. Lastly, if you'd like a CPD certificate for watching this presentation, please get in contact and we can arrange this for you. Thank you again for watching. Goodbye.